You've heard me say this before. I like working with people who are either not saved or brand new to all this because they sort of have the boldness and the audacity just to sort of read the Bible and believe it for what it says. You know, sometimes if you've been kind of walking with the Lord for a long, long time, you've been in church, you sort of, you know, if you're like me, you sort of maybe make excuses why certain things don't happen or, you know, but, but people that don't know the Lord, they just sort of read the Bible and they go, well, I guess I'm supposed to see angels and spirits and I'm supposed to see healing and deliverance and all these kinds of things. They just sort of believe it for what it says. So if you're like me, you've probably, I'm encouraged when I see that sort of faith, that kind of childlike faith that just says, well, the Bible says it, I should believe it. And um, it always sort of inspires me. One of the interesting things in the Bible are these, these beings called angels that are extraordinary creatures. And I've, I've had senses, probably if you're like me, and if you've been around the church and you're sort of a, you know, maybe a bit of a, um, uh, you know, kind of a spiritual person, you've, you've probably had the sense of seeing an angel, feeling some protection, having a presence, something like that. But, but I've often wondered, what would it be like to just have an angel sort of stand in front of you and give you a message? Maybe some of you have experienced that. I haven't experienced it. We're actually, you know, somebody's saying, okay, here's what I want you to do. I want you to, so I'm going to, we're going to find out today, how many of you all want to learn how to see angels? All right, we're going to learn how to do that today, okay? So uh, it comes from an unusual place, and it's sort of tucked away in a story um, that is consistent with, with first, first century um, Greek literature. There's a story about a, a ship, a, sh a shipwreck. Paul has been, as you know, he's been wrongfully accused uh, by, by the Jewish leadership. So he's appeared before the Sanhedrin, which is the highest Jewish court. He's, he's appeared before two governors, Festus and Felix. He's, he's appeared before the, um, the, the appointed king of the region, King Agrippa. And now he's on his way to go see, um, to go, to go see Caesar. So he's appealed his case to the highest court on planet earth at that time he's going to go to see caesar and so they've loaded up the ship they're taking him on this journey along the way there's going to be all these encounters and one of the things you're going to find out is there's a lot of interesting language because the sea was fascinating to this culture it would be sort of like maybe we would see space travel or something so if you love to see a space movie and you're you like all of the language and all of the excitement of it this is how sea travel would be seen to greek culture it was exciting so when you read these narratives there's all all this language about nautical terminology and things is that you can just see the obsession people would have in that culture, that first century culture with sea travel. And uh, so, so you, um, Greek authors would write often their narratives would have these great tales of, of travel. So the story is kind of tucked into the middle of Something that, frankly, may not be all that interesting to us. Most of us, you know, we don't think much about sea travel. Maybe some of us do. Um, so it's kind of picture this sort of event, but you're, but you're reading it kind of like a first century. You're seeing it like a first century movie. There's, there's all the excitement. It's an action-adventure kind of thing with, with seas and wrecks and crews and soldiers. And, and this is what it's designed to, to, uh, to evoke in us, an action-adventure. Paul is the hero, this epic uh, journey through the, to, from, from Jerusalem to Rome. And uh, we're going to take a look at that today, and we're going to learn something in spite of the fact that it seems to be, the main narrative seems to be about sea travel and adventure, there's this really interesting thing about an angel. Let's see if we can learn something about this today. Let's pray together. God, I thank you for your power in our midst. Thank you for your presence. Holy Spirit, come. We've already sung your praises, and your word tells us you inhabit the praise of your people, so you're here. You're here in power, power to change, power to deliver, power to set free. Lord, I pray that we would walk every day in that power, every day in that authority, and more and more and more learn what it means to be sons and daughters of the Most High God. For all of these things, Lord, we're grateful. In the name of Jesus, amen. Guys, if we could have that map up, let's take a quick look because the, the, uh, the direction, everything is kind of important uh, so that we can kind of understand what's happening. As you know, Paul is in here in this Palestine area. He's, in, he's actually up here in Caesarea right here. And uh, he's going to go on a ship, a ship ride. He's going to go all on. The, the weather is terrible. It's late. It's late. Uh, it's in the late fall, so winter is coming. It's a dangerous time to settle to sail the Mediterranean. So what they have to do is they have to sort of hug this sea, this sea line, um, uh, 
because the weather is so bad. So they're trying to travel, but they're trying to keep uh, make progress in winds that are against them. They're going to go over here to Crete. They, they end up in this place called Fairhaven, but they don't feel safe. There's a lot of exposure here. So the idea is they're going to take a bit of a risk, and they're going to move over here to try to get this port of Phoenix. But along the way, they're going to get blown out by a, by a northeast wind that's going to going to blow them off track, and they're going to end up drifting in, in, this, in the Adriatic Sea here until they actually end up, there's a terrible storm here, and they're going to end up wrecking on this island of Malta. So I want you to kind of have that as we read through the story. I want you to have kind of visualize what's happening because it'll, it'll make more sense to you. And if you have your Bibles, you can turn to Acts 27. And uh, let's begin running. Going to cover a lot of ground today. We've got the text there for you, so kind of buckle up and just sort of hear this. I'm, gonna, I'm not going to make a ton of commentary. Just sort of read it, see it the way if they had movie theaters in the first century, you'd be sort of seeing an action-adventure movie. That's what this is designed to sort of evoke in us. When it was decided that we would sail for Italy, now first of all, note that it's we. So Luke is back in the picture. Luke is the author of Acts. It's been a few years. It's probably been two years since he's been with Paul. Paul's been um, imprisoned in Caesarea. It is, it is supposed that that Luke remained in Jerusalem gathering data to write, this, to write this book. So he's probably been gathering data, interviewing people. Now he's back. Paul's been released. He's on this journey to Rome. And so now Paul and his autobiographer or his biographer are now again um, uh, joined together. Paul and some of the other prisoners were handed over to a centurion named Julius. A centurion was a person who was in charge of 100 soldiers who belonged to the imperial regiment. We boarded a ship from Ad Adramidium, about to sail for ports along the coast of the province of Asia, and we put out to sea. Aristarchus, a Macedonian from Thessalonica, was with us. Just sort of an important prisoner showing that these are, this was an important trip. They're, these are prisoners of Rome, and Paul is in the company of other um, uh, of other important uh, uh, prisoners of Rome. The next day we landed at Sidon, and Julius, in kindness to Paul, allowed him to go to his friends so they might provide for his needs. One of the things you're going to find is Paul is an unusual prisoner. So it allows him to go into port, presumably with some guard, to meet with friends to get provisions. This is going to be a trip that will take many months. And so he's, he, in, that, in that culture, the prisoners had to, to fend for themselves. Their families and friends had to support them. So even on ship travel, they had to have support for themselves. So he goes in to get some support. Um, uh, for the trip. From there, we put out to sea again and passed to the Lee of Cyprus. You're going to see a lot of Lee. I had to look it up. I said, I don't know what to the Lee means. To the Lee means, when, and maybe some of you who are nautical experts can correct me if I get this wrong. I think I got it right. Lee means that the wind is blowing into the land. So if you have a Lee wind, it means that that you're coming into, into the land. And so it can be very helpful if you need to, to kind of be pushed into land. It can also be very dangerous if there's big storms and there's a lot of rocky shores, you can be pushed in and your boat can be crushed. So what it means is a lee wind means you're going into the, uh, the beach, into the shoreline. From there, we put out to sea again. That means the wind is blowing in that direction. We passed to the Lee of Cyprus because the winds were against us. When we had sailed across open sea off the coast of Cilicia and Pamphylia, we landed at Myra in Lycia. My job is hard. <laughs> Whew. There the centurion found in Alexandria, an Alexandrian ship sailing for Italy. They're going to change ships here and put us on board. One, this would be a fairly highly trafficked area, a lot of grain. Egypt is on that southern border of the Mediterranean. They would, they would send grain up through, uh, up, up across the Mediterranean, up into these ports to be carried into Rome. And so they've, they've switched ships here. Either It's sort of like a, any kind of freight. You're going to try to have your load filled regardless of which way you're, you're sailing, you don't want to sail with an empty ship. The merchant is not making any money if they're sailing with an empty ship. The same way a person who owns a freight company doesn't make money when the truck, trucks are driving around empty. So you try to fill the freight as much as you can. And this is what's happened. They need to find uh, a bigger boat to travel the, the larger portion of the journey here. So they're, they're switching boats here. 
Uh, when we had sailed across the, uh, to Slea, blah, 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 the centurion found an Alexandrian ship sailing for Italy. Uh, that's where Rome is, of course, and put us on board. We made slow headway for many days and had difficulty arriving in Snedis. When the wind did not allow us to hold our course, we sailed to the Lee of Crete. So they kind of traveled, if you remember back to the map, they're traveling along the Mediterranean, and now they're going into this island of Crete opposite of Salmon, and we arrived at the coast with difficulty and came to a place called Fairhaven near the town of Lycia. Much time had been lost, and sailing had already become dangerous because by now it was uh, after the Day of Atonement. It's getting to be the late fall. So Paul warned them, men, I can see that our voyage is going to be disastrous and bring great loss to ship and cargo and to our own lives also. But the centurion, instead of listening to what Paul said, followed the advice of the pilot and the owner of the ship since the harbor was unsuitable to winter in the, in the, and the, the majority decided that we should sail on hoping to reach Phoenix and winter there. This was the harbor in Crete facing the southwest and the northwest. So they want to find a place they can sort of tuck in where they have shelter from the wind um, in, a, in a safer harbor. So they're going to make a risk. It's, 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 the, the weather is bad. Uh, this is a risk to try to, to reach this safer harbor. In ver th verse 13, they see their opportunity. When a gentle south wind began to blow, they saw their opportunity, so they weighed anchor and sailed along the, the shore of Crete. Before very long, a wind of hurricane forest called the nor Northeaster swept down from the island. The, the ship was caught by the storm and could not head into the wind, so we gave way to it. So they're trying to get to that port, but the wind just blows them into the, into the sea, off, way off course. Uh, the, the ship was caught by the, by the storm and could not head into the wind, so we gave way to it and were driven along. As we passed to the lee of a small island called Cauda, we, we were hardly able to make the lifeboat secure. So the men hoisted it aboard. They passed ropes under the ship itself to hold it together. So what they would do, this I thought this was interesting, is they would put ropes or straps under the ship, and then they would winch them down, and that would pull the whole of the ship up keeping it secure so it wouldn't, it wouldn't shatter against the, 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 all of the twisting and the contortions of the wind and the storm and the waves. So they, uh, they secured the boat. They passed ropes along uh, underneath the boat to hold it together because they were afraid that they would run aground on the sandbars uh, uh, of Sirtis. They lowered the sea anchor and let the ship be driven along. So they're, they're, they're trying to slow the progress by dropping anchor. We looked at such violent battering from the storm that the next day we began to throw cargo overboard. On the third day, we threw the ship's tackle overboard with our own hands. This would be a heavy, probably sort of the main sail. They're throwing even now the important parts of the, of the ship. So the idea is they don't have, this is big equipment. So now they're starting to chuck the important stuff because they're really worried. So with their own hands, they don't have cranes and things uh, to help them with. They're throwing this heavy equipment off of the ship to lighten the load. When neither sun or stars appeared for many days and the storm continued raging, we finally gave up hope of being saved. Verse 21, after they had gone for a long time without food, Paul stood up before them and said, Men, you should have taken my advice not to sail from Crete. Then you have lost, uh, then you have lost, you would have spared your, yourselves this damage and loss. But now I urge you to keep up your courage because not one of you will be lost, only the ship will be destroyed. Last night, an angel of God to whom I belong and to whom I serve stood beside me and said, Do not be afraid, Paul. You, you must stand trial before Caesar, and God has graciously given you the lives of all who sail with you. So keep up your courage, men, for I have faith in God that it will happen just as he told me. Nevertheless, we must run aground to some, uh, on some island. Now what's happening, the men have been fasting for a long time, probably out of fear, but more likely it's, it's, a, re, it's a religious uh, ceremony. They're trying to appease the gods that have brought this great storm. So they've been fasting now for many, many days, 14 days, and they're very weak now. So Paul is saying, you got to eat something. You know, he's, he's envisioning, he's had this visitation from an angel. He, he, he doesn't have every detail. He knows they're going to wreck on an, uh, they're going to run aground on an island, which means the men are going to have to make a difficult swim, you know, to the shore. They're going to need strength for this. So he's saying, hey, basically what he's saying, 
saying, your gods ain't going to do nothing. My God has already come and talked to me about this. I already know what's going on. So stop all of this needless fasting. Eat yourself a roast beef sandwich, and let's go do this thing. You've got some hard work to do in front of you. On the 14th night, we were still being driven across the Adriatic Sea. When about midnight, the sailors sensed they were approaching land. They took a sounding. This is a way of, of measuring. Uh, and they found that the water was 120 feet deep. A short time later, they took another sounding again and found it was 90 feet deep. So it's getting more and more shallow. Fearing that we would be dashed against the rocks, they dropped four anchors from the stern and prayed for daylight. So they dropped these anchors, hoping to sort of slow the ship down. The idea is to drag the anchors so it wouldn't be crushed against the rock. Remember, there's this lee wind that's, that's, that's pushing them into the shoreline. In, a, in an attempt to escape from the ship, the, sailor let the, the sailors left the lifeboats down to the sea, pretending they were going to lower some anchors from the bow. Then Paul said to the centurions and the soldiers, unless these men stay with the ship, they cannot, you cannot be saved. So the soldiers cut the rope and held the lifeboat and let it adrift. So remember, there's, there's sailors who are not part of the Roman military, and then there's these soldiers, and they're all sort of together. So there's kind of a uh, it looks like there's a little bit of a, you know, a balance of authority. The sailors are going, hey, we're cutting bait. We're going to lower these, these boats. We're going to pretend that, uh, that, that we're going to go out and drop anchors, but we're going to go. So what it seems like Paul is saying, Paul is, uh, it, it, it appears that he's concerned for the safety of the sailors. He says they're going to they're gonna put to sea, and they're going to be dashed to pieces. But then there also seems to be a word spoken to him that all of the people are going to be spared on the ship. So if people start to leave the ship, they're not going to be spared as God has promised them. So he's saying, we all got to stay together here or, or uh, all is going to be lost. So what the soldiers do is they then, they, they cut the, they just cut the, the boats loose. Uh, pretending they were going to lower some of the ship. Then Paul said to the centurions and soldiers, unless these men stay with the ships, you cannot be saved. So the soldiers cut the ropes that held the lifeboats and let it drift away. So now it's interesting that Paul Paul's an unusual, um, he's an unusual prisoner. I mean, he's, he should be the one sort of receiving instruction. Hey, you need to do this and go to this. But Paul has this, Paul has this authority, both in the spirit realm and with people. He's an, he's an impressive guy. He physically, he wasn't impressive according to, you know, according to what, what was written about him. But, but, he, but he was able to command the authority of a, of a centurion, an owner of a boat, soldiers and sailors. He's telling them what to do. He's telling those soldiers, hey, these sailors, are gonna, they've got a plot to escape. You can't let them do it. Everybody's got to stay on the ship if they're going to be spared. The angel talked to me. And people are listening. Listen, church, when you move and we move in the power of God Almighty and God gives us a word that's compelling, a big problem with the church is we've lost our power. The, 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 the exercise of religion has been about the answers of questions and we debate and we take it into the political realm and there's all these things, but we don't have, we don't have power from God. When you have a word from God, when you have a power from God, when people see lives being changed... That is appealing to everybody. Mankind sees that. They have to respond to it. We talked about this last week. It, when, when people see the raw, naked power of God, they have to respond to it. Sometimes they reject it. Sometimes they're drawn to it. But they're compelled to respond to it. Sometimes I worry that our faith is too easy to be ignored. It's just... Oh, those are those Christian people. They don't have much impact. They vote a certain way and they behave a certain way, but there's no real power. We need to rediscover the power of the church, of the living God. Amen. These people are listening to Paul. He's coming with authority. He's coming with power. He's heard a message from an angel. When daylight came, let's see, just before dawn, Paul urged them all to eat. For the last 14 days, says you've been in constant suspense and gone without food. You haven't eaten anything. Now, I urge you to take some food. You need, to you need it to survive. Not one of you will lose a single hair from his head. After he said this, he took some bread and gave thanks to God and broke it in front of them all. Isn't this interesting? Paul, the prisoner, is the guy breaking bread, praying. There's 270 people on board. He's breaking bread. He's sort of doling it out. He's blessing it. They're gathered around him. He has authority. They're looking to him for comfort. He's giving them instructions. They were all encouraged and ate some food 
uh, food themselves. Altogether, there, there were 276 of us on board. When they had eaten as much as they wanted, they lightened the ship by throwing the grain into the sea. This, again, this would be a, uh, a lot, most likely a ship going back and forth on trade routes from Egypt into <coughs> into Italy, into Rome. And so now, now the owner is dropping all of the grain, uh, this, the very thing that was going to make him money in the first place. When daylight came, they did not recognize the land, but they saw a bay with the sandy beach where they decided to run the ship aground if they could. Cutting loose the anchors, we left them in the sea and at the same time untied the ropes that held the rudders. When they hoisted the foresail to the wind and made for the beach, but the ship struck a sandbar and ran aground. The bow struck fast and could not move, and the stern was broken to pieces by the pounding of the surf. The soldiers planned to kill the prisoners to prevent any of them from swimming away and escaping, but the centurion wanted to spare Paul's life and keep them from carrying out their plans. He ordered those who could swim to jump overboard first and get to the land. The rest were to get there on planks or on uh, other pieces of the ship. In this way, everybody reached the land safely. <coughs> so... The, the, ship is, the ship is running aground. The soldiers in that culture, if you lost your prisoner, if your prisoner escaped, it was your life. So we might look at this on being sort of a kind of a cruel thing, but this is what Roman soldiers did. They were trained assassins. They were trained killers. Killing people was their job. So they're looking at these prisoners and they're going, well, it's either their life or my life, and so I guess it's going to be your life. If the prisoner escaped then it was their life that was they were culpable for it with their own life. So the obvious thing to do was to kill the prisoner before, um, before they escaped. You, we, you, could, you can be reminded of the story of the Philippian jailer who when, the, when God opened the doors, Paul said, hey, don't take your life. We're still here. We, did, we haven't left. So, you know, maybe, maybe that story was known among the soldiers. I, we don't know. Whatever the case is, the, the centurion trusted Paul. Paul had said, everybody's going to be spared. Nobody's going nobody's to die or escape. And so they, they trusted him. And so the soldiers want to kill the prisoners, according to Roman custom. The centurion says, no, we're going to be all right. Everybody will stay preserved, and nobody's going to die or run away. And so he spares Paul's life. That in, in and of itself was, was really extraordinary, that a prisoner would have that kind of authority to sort of change the habits of hardened Roman soldiers. They're going, well, this is protocol. If they're going to escape, kill them before they escape. And the guy's going, no, no, they'll, they're going to stay here. So he's able to spare not only his own life, but the lives of, um, of the other prisoners. And then they wreck on this island. We'll take a look at uh, the, the shipwreck on the island of Malta next week or uh, here in, in subsequent weeks. It's an interesting story to me. Again, it's interesting because it's sort of, as I'm studying it, I'm reading through it, there's a lot of interesting detail in it. I'm not... I, I know almost nothing about sailing. I know, you know, little about, you know, the appeal of of uh, sea travel and all of those things. I know that for Jewish people, they weren't a seafaring nation. So Jewish people sort of saw the sea as dangerous. They didn't really, you know, there was there was monsters in it. It was sort of a sign of God's judgment. So so Jewish people would not have the appeal that Greek people would. So this is very much about writing an appealing story to Greek people. It's not really designed for a Jewish audience. This Luke wrote for the, for the whole world, for the Gentile world. So it, there's all these little details. But if you're like me, I'm kind of going, okay, I, I, I got it. Seafaring, it's, you know, it's all the adventure, the, the, you know, the Iliad and the Odyssey, great traveling adventure, you know, part of the pop culture. By the way, it does teach us something about, I could talk a lot about this. It does teach us something about the gospel and culture. Because culture is, the gospel is always embedded in culture, isn't it? In fact, one person said it this way, culture is both a palace and a prison. Sometimes, sometimes culture, culture, the gospel flourishes in certain cultures and, it's, and it has great access to people. And then usually there's a shift in culture and then it becomes a bit of a, a, bit of a prison. And then, you, then, then the church has to rethink sort of, we're in that season right now where there's a big shift in culture. And sometimes it causes us to be afraid. It creates fear in us because there's 
there's so much change, but it's always these extraordinary opportunities for the gospel to, be, to reach the world. So we're in the middle of that. Any church that is sort of a student of culture and history knows there's a big shift coming, and uh, it causes some people to fret and to worry and others to, to go, let's, let's bring it on. And so it can cause tension in churches. There's all kinds of challenges. I think it's very exciting, frankly. I think it's a great opportunity for the gospel to move forward. But you've got to kind of rethink things about how we do church, how we do this whole thing called faith, you know. But um, in this particular example, another big sort of shift in culture, and, and the gospel is sort of flourishing. Luke is writing in this very pagan context, in this, in this Greek context. It's exciting. It's an exciting uh, epic novel of Paul, the hero, the prisoner being taken all the way to... And there's all these little details, all the... Did you, did you kind of, I wanted to read the whole story. I thought maybe I'd just sort of pad, but I wanted you to hear the details. This, is, this story takes more time than any other of Luke's writings. In both the, the Gospel of Luke and in Acts, he takes more time with this. He loves writing about it. It's exciting to him. This is his sort of epic narrative of, of travel and adventure and the sea and all that. And I, I'm like, I get it. I, I, you know, straps under the ship, bolting them down, dropping the anchors and taking, you know, all the stuff. Leeward. All right, it's a lee wind. I had to look that up. All right, Luke, we get it. You like the sea. Cool. Awesome. But if you're like me, I'm like, what about the freaking angel? I mean, that's a pretty big deal. And, and, I, and he just sort of passes over it. I'm like, I, maybe angels were so common. He's like, yeah, another angel came and saw Paul. But there's not a lot of examples of it. Frankly, even for Paul, there were, there were times when he saw them, and we probably don't have every account of every time that an angel visited Paul. But, but even so, it was, it was sort of an unusual here. I mean, to me, that's the heart of the story. And it just sort of becomes a little, you know, sidebar for, oh, by the way, this angel came. Now, you know something about angels. Angels were, were fearsome creatures. I mean, in fact, just about every time there's an appearance of an angel, they say something like, don't be afraid, fear not. You know, yeah, I could crush you in just a second, but I'm not gonna. You know, I'm here on your behalf. So we know something about angels. They were fearsome. In the Old Testament, one angel would kill like 70,000 people. Another one, I think it was a story of 120,000 people. One angel. Scripture says that we were made a little lower than the angels. Now think about that. If one angel could just could, could kind of bring that kind of punishment and judgment to so many people, one angel, and yet I'm created a little lower than him in my natural state, in my, in my, my, uh, uh, my unfallen state, you can start to get a little bit of a sense of who we were at creation. These extraordinary creatures, and yeah, you're just a little bit over, a little bit under, made a little bit lower than the angels. And yet, when, when, when history is fulfilled, we're going to rule the angels. When we take on the authority and the mantle of Jesus Christ, we rule these extraordinary creatures. Now, if I'm looking at me, and I'm looking at this picture of angels, I go, yeah, I'm not a little lower than the angels. I'm way, way lower than the angels. It gives you an idea how far we've fallen from how God created humans to be, what his purpose, what his plans. We've fallen really, 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 really far. The whole narrative of gospel is about redemption, restoring all that was lost. A little lower than the angels. Extraordinary creatures. They're messengers of God. I want to see one. I don't, we're, Christians are not supposed to, the, Jesus says it's a wicked generation that looks for signs and always looks for things, but the idea is that we sort of look for the stuff instead of looking for the Savior, you know? Sometimes we want to see Jesus move, but we don't want to see Jesus. You know, some people say we, we look for his hands, but not his face. So I don't, I'm not suggesting that. I'm not suggesting that we become a people that sort of runs after every sign and every rabbit trail. We have the full revelation of Jesus. So we don't need, we don't need the signs the way um, sometimes cultures in the past have. We have Jesus. We have the word. We have the spirit. We have the people. We have the power, all those things. But I still want to see an angel. 
And I don't mean the angel and sort of, I had a sense of something, of feathers, came, some, sometimes people will tell stories of feathers falling from the, no, I, you know, feathers falling, maybe it's true, maybe it's not, I don't know who am I to say it is or it isn't. But, you know, I'm not talking about that. I'm not talking about, I just sense, I heard a flutter, people say a fluttering of wings. It's actually not, you know, I, angels probably don't have wings and fly, it's probably, they're spiritual. But I'm not talking about a flutter of wings. I want, I want an angel right next to me. Hey, my name is, you know, angel so-and-so, and I have a message for you. Here's what I want you to do. I want, you, I want to see something like that. Oh, good. Good to see you. You're not going to kill me? Good. I'm glad about that. Yeah, I, I want to, you know. I don't know. Maybe I shouldn't. Some people would say I shouldn't want that, but I'm like, that would be pretty awesome. And I've, as I've said, prob- and if you've walked with God for any a length of time, and particularly if you're, you've, you've had a sense that there's been something divine. Anybody kind of had some of those experiences? Like, man, I look back and I've, I've had this happen to me. So we've had that. Maybe some of you have actually had an angel sit in your dinner table and talk to you and give you instructions. If you have, I'd love to hear that story, but I haven't. So how do you, how do you see an angel? Um, this is not a comprehensive lesson on the theology of angels. First of all, we're not supposed to worship them. We know that. Um, they are, they're here for our benefit. They're, they're real thing. They're real creatures. Demons are fallen angels. They're rebelled against God. And so, but angels are for our benefit. So this is not an extensive study of angels. But sort of as I've reflected, there's basically about like five ways. First one is, you could be an idiot. I spent most of my life as an idiot and did really stupid, dangerous, dumb things. And we know that we have angels, actually whole hosts of angels that guard and protect us. So when you live foolishly, you are testing and pressing the issue here a lot. And I have pressed it. This, this picture, I think, sort of sums up what I think my guardian angel must be doing at any given time. <laughs> so that's one way. I can give you a full, extensive, doctoral level study of how to live like an idiot, and you will then probably have lots of guardians, angels going, seriously, again, seriously? I could go oh, story after story after story, and as I reflect on them, I go, yeah, there was something protecting me in a huge way. The problem with living like an idiot, apart from the obvious danger and um, all of that. The problem with is, yes, you're being protected. Yes, you're being defended, but you're probably not seeing it. I didn't see it. So you're probably not seeing the angel completely coming in and intervening on all of your stupidity. So that, that might be an approach. I wouldn't recommend it because the likelihood of you actually seeing or any, interacting with that angel in any significant or helpful way is probably uh, minimal. Probably all you're doing is just frustrating the angel or angels that have been assigned to you. So that's probably not your best option. The second option, according to scriptures, you could be rebellious. You could, do, you could really just so strongly and violently oppose God that he finally says, okay, I've, I've had enough of you. I'm going to send one of these awesome creatures and take your life. I, again, probably not recommend. You might see the angel for a second, and then you're going to probably pretty immediately regret it, and that would sort of be the end of it. So that's not, I'm going to probably rule out um, uh, you know, the number, the number two methodology of sort of seeing an angel, that's not, just not coming with my recommendation. So don't live rebelliously to God. You may see an angel for a moment, but you will regret that you did. The third way, according to Scripture, is you can be hospitable. You know, the Bible says that some people have entertained angels. They didn't even know it. Um, and, of course, that's alluding to, st- to stories of, of Abraham and Sarah and other stories where people encountered angels. They didn't even know it. I would suggest to you that when we show hospitality, when we, when we feed the poor, when we clothe the naked, we care for the widows, the orphans, I think there's a lot of times when there are divine things happening and we, we're interacting with angels. We don't know it. I mean, they're, sometimes I think they're here in sort of secretive ways, helping, protecting, guarding, guiding. I felt that. But, it, but again, you probably you're probably not going to interact with them. You're going to kind of do this thing called charity and hospitality, and you might entertain one you know, unknowingly, but you probably still are not going to see it and speak to them. Maybe, I don't know, but the Bible says maybe not. So that's a good, that's a, being hospitable is a good way, thing to do, but probably not going not to see an angel. The, th- the fourth way is you can be a worshiper. 
now, worship is powerful, and kind of the older I get, the more I'm, I'm learning and growing. I know it's kind of a strange season of my life right now where there are God's giving me different eyes and different ears, and I'm seeing things in different ways. And so, I'm, so there are times you just you kind of have the sense, and, and, and seeing angels is certainly going to be a characteristic of eternity. There's, there's angels singing and praising. Every time we worship, every time we worship God, our voices uh, join with the angels and saints present and past and there's this really wor- worship is more it is there's there's so much more that happens in worship than just people coming and singing songs I mean, there's lots of places we can come and sing songs i play lots of music in our community you can go to any number of areas in our community and sing songs even good songs worship is something deeper i can't but i want you to maybe this helps I remember years ago, I think in the late 90s, I went to the Promise Keeper rally that they had in, in Washington, D.C. Did anybody ever make it to that in the late 90s? There, you guys were there. There was an interesting thing. So I was, as you guys know, on the, there was these, these huge sections of it, you know, and, and it was really powerful. Me and the guys I went with, we fasted. It was the first time I'd ever fasted for any length of time. And so we fasted, we prayed. We really wanted to get everything out of this. It was powerful. So I remember standing in our section, which was relative, was like in the first, I don't know, I don't know how many sections that were there on that mall in D.C., but we're kind of in that first maybe quarter of the section, and we're singing these songs, and we're singing, and when, when our group would be done singing, you would hear people echo back, echo back, echo back. When there was applause, you'd stop, and then you'd hear it echo and echo and echo. A million people singing it was powerful when we praise god it's sort of so i'm there's something i know this sounds weird okay but let's just let's be okay with it god does weird stuff okay there's something that god's awakened in my spirit that when we sing i hear this echo i hear this echo of the saints and the angels throughout all of history praising and worshiping and it just it just echoes through me it goes so far beyond what we do here we're just this little voice that says their praise and it echoes throughout time i can't explain it i don't know what sometimes i just go ah god i don't know what you're doing but that's that's pretty awesome you hear the echoes of the voices of angels, these fearsome creatures crying out, holy, holy, holy. Some people say that modern worship is too repetitive. Seems to me like the angels say, holy, 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 throughout eternity, worthy, 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 worthy. Think of the echoes, holy, 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 worthy, 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 worthy. Beautiful, beautiful. Beautiful, loving God, mighty God, God. I think repetition is helpful. So worship is a way that we see. It's going to be a characteristic of eternity. That's a good way. I think it's a good way. My personal feeling, I think this is the best way. I want to be so necessary to God's redemptive purposes on planet Earth, that he has a message that can only be spoken to me by one of his messengers that will then go to humanity. I want to be so important to the purposes of God that he has to go, Jim, you got to get this. That's who the people of God are. I don't know if I don't know if I'll I don't know if that will be an experience I'll have. More and more and more, this is sort of becoming the reality of Cross Point Church. A message, an important one. It's vital to the redemptive purposes of God. And each one of us take our part in that. I think that's the best way. If you want to see the divine, if you want to see the power of God in your life in a way that you've never seen it before, begin working with every part of your life in the divine purposes of God. And every day will be this new adventure. Until someday, I imagine, we'll be hearing stories of like, yeah, an angel came and talked to me. Yeah, you too. Yeah, wow. Wow. I think that should just be the characteristic of God's people. 
so important, so necessary to the purposes of God that God himself is sending angels and messengers to people saying, you got to get this. You have to get this. You have to connect with this. Go see that person. Bring this message. Be a critical part of the plan and the purposes of God. Then you'll begin to see some amazing stuff. Let's be a church that walks on the front edge of all this stuff. I don't want to be on the back. I want to be on the front. You got it? God bless you. Enjoy the rest of your day.